tonight we pray. Our Father and our God, we are grateful and thankful for the privilege to once again worship you in a collective and corporate way. We give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory because you and you alone are worthy. We always confess our sins to you, Lord, because we realize that we are sinful creatures. Forgive us and cleanse us even now from all unrighteousness. Now, God, as I stand to proclaim your word, I pray for a fresh anointing, a fresh enablement, a fresh empowerment of your Holy Spirit. Use me now so that you might receive all the glory. Stand in my body, think with my mind, and talk with my tongue. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, this indeed is the day the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord? I certainly want to honor the shepherd of this flock, the angel of this house, my friend and brother, your pastor, Dr. Leslie Braxton. Amen. I certainly say again to you, happy birthday, brother, and, uh, and happy anniversary as well. It is a joy to be here again to share with you at New Beginnings. I told the church this morning uh, that um, this is about maybe less than five times that I have spoken to a live audience. Um, and um, just to feel the energy of, uh, in the room uh, makes me dizzy a little bit. <laughs> and to be able to sing, I thought about it this morning, to sing hymns with fellow believers for you, it's, it's, it's regular, but for me, it was like, wow, I missed this. And so I'm grateful uh, to be here today to share with you um, and to uh, actually preach to a live audience where I don't have to create my own energy in the room. I'm preaching to a camera, and we are still virtual there in D.C., in the D.C. area. Uh, we were trying to come back perhaps in September, but now with Delta... Um, I think our people said not yet. So uh, keep us in prayer. And we certainly hope and pray that the country will finally come to its senses and, and we'll band together and get this virus behind us. Your pastor is certainly to be commended for how he uh, looks out for your health and safety. Amen. You are blessed to have a great man of God a great preacher of the word, but more importantly, not just a great pastor and preacher, but a great person. And I am honored and delighted to call him a friend um, and a brother. There's a word I want to share with you. Take your Bibles and turn to Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, I want to read a portion of a paragraph into your hearing, verses 10 through 13. Philippians chapter 4. Verses 10 through 13. I'm reading from the New King James Bible. If you would help me out today, would you stand with me as I read the Word of God into your hearing? As I think I've told you before, there's nothing necessarily spiritual about standing when the Bible is read. Uh, but if nothing else, it gets the blood running warmer in your veins. And besides that, regardless of what happens today, when I go back, to the East Coast, I can tell everybody, I stood them up. I had them on their feet. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Reading from the New King, New King James Bible. Here's how my Bible reads. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Look at your neighbor, smile at them, and tell them, I choose to be happy. I choose to be happy. You may be seated. Several years ago, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones 
came out with a hit song that says, I can't get no satisfaction in this world anymore. The words of this song were spoken by one who had enjoyed wealth, success, and the pleasures of life. And at the end of the day, when the smoke had cleared and the dust had settled, his conclusion of life was that he could not get any satisfaction or happiness in this world. The words of this song are reminiscent of an age of people who are searching for peace, searching for contentment, searching for a true sense of happiness, only to discover that this world does not offer the human heart the happiness and satisfaction for which one is looking. For you see, brothers and sisters, there is a restlessness in the heart of humankind that says that we are searching Searching for significance, searching for happiness. But the problem is that many people cannot find what they are looking for because they are looking in all the wrong places and turning to all the wrong sources. Some seek for happiness through materialism but do not find it. Others seek for joy through sexual prowess only to end up with fleeting pleasures and bitter disappointments. And others, brothers and sisters, seek for fulfillment through obtaining positions of power in corporations or by exercising excessive control in their own homes, but they remain unfulfilled. And after turning to all of those sources, trying to find happiness and contentment, they come to the same conclusion as did Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. They can't get no satisfaction in this world anymore. I like a statement that Abraham Lincoln, who himself is said to have faced many dif dismal and difficult days, is said to have said. He said, most people are about as happy as they choose to be. I found that quote while reading a book co-authored by Frank Minereth and Paul Meyer. And the book is appropriately entitled, Happiness is a Choice. And in the book, these two well-known Christian psychiatrists suggest that if one is going to be cured of the cause and, and symptoms of depression and unhappiness, one must choose to be happy. I couldn't agree with them more. You see, many people are unhappy and some are depressed because they have chosen to be. I know that some of you would disagree with my premise and say that our happiness or unhappiness is not a matter of our conscious choice, but it is a culmination of our outward circumstances. But I've come to tell you today that you can be happy regardless of your circumstances. And that's the message that Paul is trying to convey to the Christians at Philippi. When you get a chance, you ought to read this little letter to the Philippians. There's only four chapters. And in this little missive, it is kind of Paul's thank you note. As he thanks them for how they had uh, supplied his needs for physical needs and financial needs over and over again. But it's rather interesting when you read this little, uh, this little missive that over and over again in this letter, Paul admonishes the Philippian believers to rejoice, to have joy, to be happy. And I found that rather interesting because when Paul wrote this letter, he was facing less than ideal circumstances in his own life. When Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians, he was not in a five-star hotel. He was not on a beach drinking a mimosa. But when Paul wrote this letter, he was in a Roman prison. He had been incarcerated. His freedoms had been taken away from him. And though he was facing less than ideal circumstances in his own life, over and over again, Paul encourages the Philippian believers to rejoice. And I wondered why in this, I came to the conclusion is because Paul understood that genuine Christian joy does not come from one's circumstances, outer circumstances, but genuine Christian joy emanates from an inner peace of one knowing that he or she has a personal relationship with Christ. And so I've come to talk to somebody today because you made up your mind that you are not going to be happy until all of the circumstances in your life are ideal, that you've decided not to be happy until all the stars of your life line up perfectly where you're going to be unhappy all your life. 
But I've come to tell you today that you can be happy regardless of your circumstance when you understand that happiness is a choice. And so if you don't mind, let me unpack this little text. Let me unravel it, walk around in it a little bit, and I'll take my seat. I believe this text is tailored to teach us some practical lesson. First of all, it's tailored to teach us in the first place that your sufficiency, you need to know that your sufficiency is in the Savior. Listen to how Paul opens up, if you will, in verse 11. He says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. You see, brothers and sisters, Paul is now um, commending the Philippian believers for how over and over again they had, cut, wrote, they had risen to the occasion and met his financial, ministerial, physical needs. And Paul is saying in verse 11, I'm not writing this to you because I'm trying to get another offering from you. He said, no, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. That word learn there means to know from experience, to acquire the habit of. It is a term that was used in mystic religions as a kind of initiation term to learn a secret initiation passage. And if one learned those, that, that, that secret, then one could then have entrance into that mystic religion. Paul Christianizes that term and says that in, in essence, I, my life and my many experiences of life have taught me the secret of contentment. Can the church say contentment? That word content there is an interesting word because it is a word that means self-sufficient, self-sufficiency. It is a word that was used by the Stoic philosophers for self-sufficiency, meaning not needing, not, not needing the aid of one's outward uh, environment in order to be happy. Paul Christianizes this stoic idea and says, you're right, I don't need my circumstances to determine my sense of happiness, but unlike you stoics who are self-sufficient, he says, I am Christ-sufficient because I have a relationship with Christ. I have learned the secret of being content, and my contentment doesn't come from my circumstances, it comes from my relationship with Christ. You know, it's kind of like the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. A thermometer is controlled by the conditions of the room. If you walk into the room and the room is hot, the mercury rises. If you walk in the room and the room is cold, the mercury falls because a thermometer is controlled by the environment, the temperature of the room. But a thermostat, on the other hand, is not controlled by the condition of the room, but rather it regulates the temperature of the room. And many people today immature folk they have what I call um, a, a thermometer kind of joy I'm happy if I make the right amount of money I'm happy if I have the right job I'm happy if I marry the right person I'm happy if my circumstances are ideal but friends when you walk with God for a while you learn not to practice a thermometer kind of joy and happiness but rather a thermostatic happiness and joy which means that I can be happy regardless of my circumstances I may not eat T-bone steaks every day, but I'm happy eating peanut butter and jelly. I may not live in the house I want to live in, but I'm happy in my apartment. I may not drive the car I want to drive, but I'm happy on, at the bus stop because my sense of contentment and happiness does not come from my happenings, but rather it comes from my inward relationship with Christ. Am I talking to some single person today? You made up your mind. I can't be happy because won't nobody date me. They won't take me out. Listen, baby, get yourself a pedicure, manicure. Get your hair done. Buy yourself a new dress and take your own self out. Because your happiness shouldn't come from another man or woman. It ought to come from your relationship with Christ. And friends, when you understand that your sufficiency is in the Savior, it tells me that you have more than likely matriculated at one of the two major universities of life. In this text, there are two schools, two major universities that show up in this little text. I, I, I'll call the first one the University of Prosperity. 
Paul says in verse 12, he says, for I know how, how to abound. That word abound means to increase. He says, I, he said, everywhere and in all things, I've learned to be full. He says, listen, he says, listen, I, I, I know what it's like. I know what it's like to, to be prosperous because I've been to the university of prosperity. I know what it's like to have plenty of money in my pocket. I know what it's like to have food on my table because I've been to the university of prosperity. I, 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 was, I was born in an influential family. I came up in, a, in an influential background. I was a Hebrew among Hebrews. I was educated at the finest schools of my day because I've been to the University of Prosperity. He says, I know what it's like for God to bless me, to prosper and not allow my prosperity to cause me to lose a healthy uh, a acknowledgement and sense of a need for God in my life. Someone has rightly suggested that prosperity has, has done more to hurt some believers than adversity because when some of us you know, make a nickel more than somebody else, it goes to our head and we walk around with our nose in the air, your nose so far in the air until it, it, it breaks you would drown it seems that the more money that some of us make the less we feel like we need God in our lives and yet brothers and sisters if anybody ought to be in church every Sunday it ought to especially be those of us whose skin has been darkened by mother nature's son because everything that we've acquired as a people in this country we've got it either through the direct or indirect influence of the church don't you mistake yourself it was the church church that pricked the conscience of a racist society and pulled down the walls of segregation and now you are able to work on those jobs and, and make that money and drive those cars and live in those neighborhoods but now that some of us have moved on up to the east side and finally gotten our piece of the pie we act like we don't need to go to church anymore and Sunday is just a time to go golfing with our friends but shame on you because everything we've gotten as a people has been because of the influence of the church. So the Lord sent me to ask you this question. How high can I lift you without losing you? Because the more money and influence some of us have, the less we believe that we need God in our lives. Are y'all with me today? And he says, I've been to the University of Prosperity, but I didn't allow my prosperity to cause me to uh, not have a health acknowledgement of God in my life. But wait, there's another school that shows up in that same text. It's on the other end of the, of, of the spectrum, in that, and I call it the University of Adversity. He says, not only have I learned how to abound and, and how to increase, he says, but I've learned how to be hungry and to suffer need. Some call it the school of hard knocks. He says, Paul says, listen, life hadn't been no crystal stairs for me. There have been times, yes, and I know what it's like to have plenty of money in my pocket and plenty of food on the table and power and influence. He said, but I've also been to the university of adversity. I know what it's like to be hungry. I know what it's like to suffer need. He says, I've been, I've been, I've been uh, forsaken by friends. I spent a day and a night in the deep. I've been stoned and stoned and left for dead. He says, I know what it's like. I've been cold and hungry and not knowing where my next meal is going to come from. But whether I had plenty of money in my pocket or if I was broke and didn't have a dime, he says, I have learned in whatever state I am. To be content. Because my contentment and my happiness does not come from my happenings, but rather it comes from my interrelationship with the Lord. Um, good friend of mine, Dr. Tellis Chapman, several years ago told me this story that happened in his life. He said he decided that he and his wife would go on a, a bucket list honeymoon. He decided to take her somewhere they'd never gone before. He took her to Hawaii. They'd never gone to Hawaii before. He said, as they walked down the beach, he said, every, every sight that they saw was, was what is called postcard beauty. It was just beautiful. The sun was shining brightly, not a cloud in the sky. The birds were soaring on the warm thermals. Children were making sand castles in the sand. Others were walking down the boardwalk holding hands it was beautiful he said the foliage was effervescent it was beautiful the smell of it was wonderful he said everywhere i looked on that beach it was postcard beauty he said but then i looked 
and saw a sight on that same beach that seemed like it didn't belong there. It was an ugly sight, he said. I saw amid all of that postcard beauty, he said, I saw a homeless man rummaging through the garbage, trying to find something to eat so he could eke out a meager living for himself. He said, I was arrested by this apparent ugliness among this postcard beauty. He said he noticed that the homeless man got out of the trash what appeared to be a cold, dirty, German-fested, half-eaten hamburger. He said he got the burger out the trash and he sat down at the curbside and he began to unwrap the burger. And then he began to brush away as much dirt and debris as he possibly could from this cold, dirty, half-eaten, German-fested hamburger. He said, but before the man took a bite, he put his hands together, he bowed his head, and he thanked God for the food he was about to receive. He said, baby, did you see that, ham did you see that homeless man? He's thanking God for a cold, dirty, half-eaten, German-fested hamburger. I got to do something for him. So he went across the street to the nearest McDonald's and bought him a hot burger, some fries, and a Coke. He handed the bag to the man. The man didn't even look up at him. He got the bag, took the burger out, unwrapped it. But before he took a bite, he put his hands together. He bowed his head and he thanked God for the food he was about to receive. What you are missing is that he was just as thankful for a half-eaten, cold, dirty, German-fested burger as he was for one that was hot off the grill. That homeless man is a manifestation of what Paul said, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And if a homeless man knows how to thank God for the food he was about to receive, surely you and I who's got roof over our heads and clothes on our back and money in the bank we ought to stop complaining so much I I have learned in whatever state I am that I'm not going to allow my circumstances to control my happiness because at the end of the day I realize that happiness is a choice I choose to be happy life may not be perfect but it's still my choice don't have the money in the bank that I want but it's still my choice tired of being lonely and single are you it's still your choice tired of living in a miserable marriage are you it's still your choice Oh, brothers and sisters, you need to know that your sufficiency is in the Savior. But wait, but wait, that's one last truth. I'm just going to have two moments today in, in, in my seat. And it is this. This text is tailored to teach us secondly. You not only need to know that your sufficiency is in the Savior, but you need to know the source of your strength to be happy. There it is, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now here is one of the most misapplied and misinterpreted scriptures in all the Bible. We may get a cure all for everything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As if you can say I'm going to stand on the train tracks and the train is coming at 60 miles an hour. You're going to hold your hand up and say I'm going to stop this train because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You're going to get run over. Whenever you're interpreting a text, you ought to interpret it within its context. I can do all things through Christ. It is a participle. This is a participial statement. What is a participle? It is a verbal adjective that modifies the verb. What's the verb? The verb he's been talking about is I have learned to, to, to be content regardless of my circumstance. How are you going to do it, Paul? Christ strengthening me. In other words, in human strength alone, when my circumstances are not ideal, I can't be happy. But if Christ strengthens me, if he pushes me in the back, if he energizes me, I can do all things through Christ. I can, I can be content regardless of my 
my circumstances if Christ strengthens, energizes, empowers me. That tells me two things. First of all, it tells me you can be positive about your potential. You see, many people do not know the source of their strength to be happy in, uh, uh, in less than ideal circumstances. And because of that, their lives have re been reduced to a hopeless heap of I can't, I can't, I can't. Oh, brothers and sisters, the Christian life was never be meant to be filled with that kind of negativity. But Christ came to give us a ray of hope amid the darkness of our despair so that on the worst day of your life, when things seem like Murphy's Law is operative in your life, that everything that can go wrong does go wrong. When you understand the source of your strength to be happy comes from Christ, you can be happy regardless of your circumstance. <sighs> Have you ever, you, ever, you, you ever run into negative people, pessimistic people? I mean, people that every day they live like they got a bad case of the blues. How you doing? Ain't doing well. How you doing? Ain't going well. Listen, a broke clock is right twice a day. Every now and then, something positive ought to come out of your mouth. It tells me, friend, not only can you be positive about your potential, but when you understand that Christ is the source of your strength, so you can be happy regardless of your circumstance. It tells me you can, you can partner with the power of God. You see, w w without Christ in your life, you hear people say, I can't. But you will never hear anybody truthfully say, God and I can't. Matter of fact, the only time you use can't with God is when you put fail on the end. God can't fail. But the reality is somebody today, listen to me right now, whether in person or online, you are unhappy. And the reason you're unhappy is because life has, is not ideal. Life is not fair, whatever it might be. But brothers and sisters, am I talking to somebody today that have made up your mind that, Pastor, you don't understand with a life like mine, I can't be happy. For somebody right now, you're getting ready to face um, the next holiday coming up in September, Labor Day, without a significant loved one in your life that's passed on. Getting ready to face the first Thanksgiving later on this year without a significant person, loved one who has died, and you say, Pastor, in my grief, I can't be happy. Am I talking to somebody today that uh, you live in a marriage that causes you to live in misery. Oh, in person, y'all make people think everything's going well, but both of you deserve an Academy Award. <laughs> the reality is that you're miserable because you feel like you have to walk around on eggshells in your own house. You say, Pastor, with a marriage like this, I can't be happy. Somebody else got a way with child that has you so stressed out because you have to leave your job almost weekly because they keep cutting up. And you say, Pastor, with children like this, I can't be happy. When somebody looks at, your, looks, looks at their financial situation, it's all messed up. you like, you're facing Mount Everest, and you'll never be able to climb out of this financial despair. You say, Pastor, with finances like mine, I can't be happy. Am I talking to somebody today? That because life has not been ideal, you say, I can't be happy. Several years ago during the, during the recession, Adolf Merkel, a German billionaire who lost billions, jumped in front of a, move, of a moving train, committed suicide. And they tell me, Pastor, that even after losing billions, he was still a billionaire. What makes... Billionaires who, because they lose some of their financial portfolio, come to that point of despair that he would jump in front of a moving train. Could it be that the, the problem is that they're looking for happiness in all the wrong places? Some people turn to the alcohol bottle. And say that if I can just get drunk enough, I can pickle my brains and anesthetize my feelings and I'll escape my problem if but for a moment only to discover that when Jack Daniel wears off, your problems are still there. Others turn to the crack pipe and say, but if I can just get high enough, I'll rise above my problem if but for a moment only to discover that the, that the principle is true that whatever goes up has to come back down. And when you come back down from your drunken stupor, your problems are still there. 
others turn to the shopping mall and say, if I can just buy myself a a St. John knit or nice suit or some shoes with red bottoms, I'll be happy. But 30 days later, you've shopped yourself into a mountain of debt. Others turn to the eating table and eat themselves into bad health. But can I recommend something better than the alcohol bottle, better than the crack pipe, better than the shopping mall? Why don't you turn to Christ? Your happiness doesn't come in what you wear and what you drive and the neighborhood that you live in. There are a lot of unhappy people living in mansions. Real lasting happiness comes only through Christ. I just come to tell you today, I don't have no answers for you. I don't have any, I don't come offering any solutions to to your problems. I can't tell you, you know, if you just praise God, your credit score is going to go up and and if you praise him some more, you know, your cancer is going to leave you. I can't tell you that. But what I can tell you is that if your cancer doesn't go away, and if God chooses not to heal, and if your finances don't get any better, and if your marriage continues to be miserable, I've come to tell you this. You can still choose to be happy. Tell your neighbor, it's my choice. I still have joy after all the things have been through. I still, I still have joy. Oh, I still, come on, joy. I still have joy after all, after all the things have been through. I still have joy. Say it again. I still have joy. I still have it. I still have joy. Jesus gave it. After all the things I've been through, I still, I still have joy. Thank you, Jesus. I still have joy. I still have joy. After all, after all the things I've been through, I still, I still have joy. Mm-hmm. There were times in my life yes, when I felt I couldn't go on. Can I get a witness? But the Lord blessed me. He made me strong. I kept the faith, held on through the night. This is my assurance. Jesus made it all right. Hallelujah, I still That's the message this morning. After all, After all the things I've been through, I still, I still have joy. Mm, I, still I still have joy. Yeah. I still have joy. After all, After all the things I've been through, After all, After all the things I've been through, After all, After all the things I've been through, I've been up. After all the things I've been, I've been down. I've been level after all the things I've level been. to the ground after all the things I've been. but he picked me after up all the things and he turned I've been. me around after all the things I've been. after all, after all the things I still I still have come on keep playing that as keep playing that somebody out there in the digisphere needs to hit that button right now and how do I become a member because the preacher just set you free from the premature conclusion that you can't feel no better until your circumstances get better. That real joy is a despite reality. Despite my health, despite my money, despite what people are doing around me, despite the politics, in Jesus I have a joy the world doesn't give and the world can't take away. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, honestly, on the faith journey, some days we walk in that joy, we receive it, and then other days we turn away from it and get caught up in the stuff again. Is that honest? I wonder how many of you who know Jesus have been inspired by the sermon to go back and go get your joy. Amen. 
When you leave here today, somebody, I hope you, somebody already saved, chooses to walk in the joy that's available to you despite whatever's going on. Amen? Because that's the good news today, that you can have joy despite what's going on around you because Jesus is still in you. Hit that button if you're out there in the digisphere, how I become a member. And if you're in here and you don't have a church home, if you're in here and don't have a church home, I don't care where you come from, I don't care if you're tall, you're short, you're wide, you're thin, black, white, gay, straight, don't matter. If you need a savior, and we all do, and if you have a savior but need a church home, and we all do, all you got to do is come down to the aisle, tell Sister Janice, I need, I need a church home here. And if after service, you want a church home, just come on, you can ask us then, but you just, now's the time to come, whosoever will whosoever will you can join the family we ain't perfect but we are persuaded that nothing will separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus I still after all this stuff after all this stuff after all the after all this drama after all the after all this chaos after all the trifling relatives all that baby mama After stuff. All, the all the baby daddy disappointments. Two, three times in rehab. All the been. been furloughed on the After job. All the been. Aches and pains After through my body. All the been. Trouble in the After air. All the been. Sick of COVID. All the been. Facing eviction. After all. After all. After all, After all the I still, I still have joy. Come on, put your hands together. Bless the name of the Lord. Somebody tell Dr. Watson for preaching this morning. Oh, my God. If you weren't here at the first service, make sure you go online and get that sermon, too, because he gave us a one-two punch. Lord, Lord, Lord. 